welcome to this episode of the Event Manager Podcast, the podcast for event professionals who want to stay out of the game by learning from leading innovators in the event industry. My name is Miguel Levsch and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of EventMB. In this episode titled Technology as a Catalyst of Community, I have the pleasure of speaking with Josh Hudson Pillar, the CEO of Juno. In this episode, we cover some great topics around community and technology, including how do you make technology a catalyst of community and not a deterrent to community. We talk about the important difference between functional and utility-based software. We talk about why tracking what people do rather than what people declare is the game changer. We talk about how organizations are ultimately looking for value, and that value may not necessarily come from events as we know them. We also talk about the reality of hybrid attendees, what they are, and how do you adapt to the reality of having hybrid attendees at your events. I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation, and I invite you to check out the other episodes of the Event Manager Podcast. Each episode features an amazing event professional and thought leader sharing their words of wisdom and valuable advice on some of their favorite topics. Check them out on our website or wherever you get your podcasts. So hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Event Manager Podcast. I'm delighted to have Josh Hudson Pillar join us today. I hope I said that correctly. It's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a fun name, but uh, it's, it's great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's great to be here, and you did a great job. You nailed it. <laughs> Good stuff. So Josh, um, we've only met recently. I had a pleasure of connecting with you a few days ago, and it was a lot of fun, our conversation. So I wanted to make sure we captured it on the podcast, which I think is, is always good. Um, tell us, tell the listeners who you are and, and, and how did you kind of get to where you are today? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, like a lot of things in life, um, you just keep taking one step forward as, as doors and opportunities open. Um, I got into software about, gosh, 13, 14 years ago, started a company uh, to help primarily Fortune uh, 1000 companies give back uh, money and time to their local communities. And so it was called Profits for Purpose. We built that company up, had about a million global employees on the platform. Uh, we sold it. Uh, and I started a company called CrowdHub, uh, which is a custom software agency. So we would go in to companies like HP or the United Nations, and we would build custom community software for employees, uh, donors, uh, consumers. Um, and I did that for eight years, uh, ran that company as founder CEO, um, and was actually quite delightful. It was fun to go in and create uh, and help solve community-based software problems. Uh, pandemic hits, and a lot of our customers just said, gosh, Josh, we don't want another platform. We, we love your community features, your gamification, the way that your tagging systems work. Can you add virtual? So we decided to you know, take our, our core community tech, um, add virtual to it, and launch Juno. Um, really, honestly, just uh, Miguel with a small thing in mind. We thought, oh, we could service four or five of our customers, just kind of let this eke along. Um, but, you know, uh, the, life had a different agenda and it very quickly started to, 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 to spin up. And we, I, I guess, you know, when launching Convening Leaders 21 was kind of a game changer for us. So we launched PCMA CL21 and gosh, next thing you know, we took funding, hired 70 people and off, off we went uh, to, to launch Juno. So that's kind of my story in a nutshell. Really interesting. And yeah, that's very much the, the pandemic. Um, you know, obviously it's had a negative effect on many people, unfortunately, but on companies like yours, I think it's it's been a, a bit of a rocket ship. And I, I know you have a history on the on the movie making side and, and the kind of video production side as well. Just tell us a little bit about that because I think that's yeah. kind of interesting. Yeah, you know, um, I was actually sitting with one of my uh mentors, uh his former C global CEO of Burger King. And we were talking one day and he was just sharing his wisdom with me. And I said to him, man, Jeff, I wish I could just capture all your wisdom uh, and make it free to the world. Uh, and we had this idea of, of what if we went in to uh, leading organizations or any organization and said, we want to capture the wisdom of, you know, uh, of, of the generations uh, and scale it down and up to one another. And it's, again, started off as just an idea. Um, and as time went on, it's, it's really what introduced me to the industry. Um, I got a chance to work with PCMA, uh, ASAE, 
uh, filming their senior leaders and, and, and their fellows and, and sharing that wisdom out. And Deborah Sexton was somebody I got a chance to meet who was the former CEO of PCMA. Um, so Wisdom Capture goes in and bite size one to three minutes, tell us stories, tell us moments that kind of forever changed your life and what you learned, what you'll always do again, what you'll never do again. And so we ended up working with great clients, Visa and Weight Watchers and Coke and some amazing companies uh, sharing their vision. And we're, I since, you know, hired a new CEO, uh, Kyle, who, who runs that. And uh, it's, a, it's a really beautiful business. It really is. Nice. And let me ask you, you know, your relationship with events, I can see the journey coming in, but while you were doing software and, and video production, what was your relationship with events then? I mean, did you run your own events for, for your own team or did you help your kind of community clients run their events? You know, we, so CrowdHub um, is a, our, our start was apps. So we were building custom apps. So we actually built event app, custom event app. So don't think white labeled. I mean, think, you know, we go in and we're, like, we're going to build you a custom app for this event. So our first one that we did of, of size was actually called LeaderCast. It's the largest one day leadership event in the world. So I think there was 130,000 people one day. There was on-site and simulcast all over the world. So it was actually a hybrid before it was hybrid. Um, and we built uh, their app. And then we went on to build some other Catalyst Conference, some other conferences, um, First Five, some other ones. And what we begin to learn, this was, gosh, seven years ago. You know, we would build these really cool apps. And we realized that people would spend more time in the app than talking to one another. And so we actually years ago started thinking creatively on how do you build technology to bring people together, not to isolate them. And so how is, how is technology a catalyst for community, not a deterrent to community? And that really began to be our, our thesis and, our, and our, our mindset when we get in to build these things. So we, my, our relationship's many, many years old before we ever got into the quote industry, we were working with one-off large corps to build really unique solutions for them. Pretty cool. And so then Juno kind of becomes the, the output of this or the, the outcome of it. Um, mm -hmm. What makes it different? I mean, you, you talked a little bit about the, the background, but as a platform, how do you see it being different from the others? You know, I've had the distinct opportunity over the last six, eight weeks to sit with some of the, our biggest competitors. Um, and actually they've taken a lot of interest in Juno. And so we've had a chance to share our product with them and get their reaction to it and, and then see what they're doing. Um, what I understand is the fundamental difference between what we do and what other folks do is there is a, 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 an idea and a concept of transactional software where, where you go in and you perform a function or it performs a function for you. And there's a difference between function and utility. Function is very transactional. Utility means the more that I use this thing, the more valuable it becomes to me. And so if it's a functional piece of software, the more you use it, it's not becoming more valuable because it's not smart. If it's a utility base, the more you use it. So think Spotify. We'll start there and then I'll, I'll kind of back into my answer because I want it to make sense for our listeners. The more I use a Spotify or a Netflix, the more it gets to know me and it says, Josh, we know that on Friday at, at around 5 p.m., this is the type of music that you like to wind down to after your weekend. So we've put this playlist together for you and added new stuff we think you'd be interested in because it's getting to know me. So what I've noticed is difference between Juno and other things are is that we are not just a functional software, we're a utility where the more you use it, it the, the more it gets to know you. How do we do that? Two ways. When you onboard into Juno, you declare what you're interested in. So you get on here and you go, hey, my name's Josh and I'm from Southern California and I love mountain biking and leadership and technology. I'm declaring to the platform, these are my interests. But like you see in Netflix, Spotify and Juno as well, there's this whole other thing called a discovered interest. A discovered is something that I never told the platform that I liked. But as I got into it, I realized, oh my gosh, I like that. So all of a sudden, there's a beer or wine uh, you know, session, or there's a governance session, or whatever it might be, and I go attend it, and I make some comments, and I like, and all of a sudden, the system goes, whoa, wait a minute. Not only have you declared you're interested, but look at all these discovery things. And then what we do is we weight those, 
We weight those based on actions, based on frequencies, and we begin to build a holistic profile of you, of your discovered and your declared interests, weighted, and then we match those to three things, people, experiences, and content. So we say, here's some content that we, we know you're going to love. Here's some people that we know you're going to love, and here's some experiences. And so the more you use Juno, and the more you declare and discover, and you can go into your profile, and you can actually go in anytime you want and make more declarations around all these tags that are built into the system. And of course, we can work with our client where our client can go in and define those tags so that as people declare and discover, it all wraps it up. So if that answers the question a little bit of, you know, you get on a platform and there's these functional things, oh, I stream something, or oh, I commented on something, or, or oh, I chatted on something. And those are all functional things. But unless it has utility behind it, where the more you use it, the smarter it becomes, then you really haven't created future state tech You've just done functional tech. And is this AI focused or is, is it? Yep. yep, exactly. And so the way that that works is the system is constantly going in there. Um, yep. And, you know, whether you want to call it a hybrid of machine learning and AI, it's going in there and it's looking at those weighted scores and it's creating intelligent outcomes back to you. So, yeah, so it's, it's improving my, all the time, right? It's not just sort of running the same algorithm. It's changing exactly. the algorithm that it runs depending on your actions. Exactly. And the way that that works is the more you do and the more that system's running, it's telling mm -hmm. your current state story. And that's what's so sure. important because one of the things we talk about is, you know, you may have declared all these things you're interested in. This is something cool the system does. If you declare a bunch of things, but you're not going to them, we'll send you a pop-up that says, hey, you said you were interested in these things, but it doesn't look like you're doing many of them. Do you want to reset your declared interests? So lots of ways that the system's going, hey, we want to make sure we're tracking with you on your development journey. Yeah, no, that then, makes sense. So, okay. I mean, I like this, um, but I find that often it's hard to motivate attendees to fill out their profile, you know, because they kind of, I mean, I do this, you know, I'm aware that the more I fill out, the more I'm going to be targeted. Sure. Um, and, and I sort of shy away from that sometimes. And I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want the organizers to know all this stuff. Sure. How do you, how do you kind of convince people to, to share that information or what is it that that's like a game changer for them that kind of makes them want to share that information? Well, there's a couple of things. First off, everybody always has the right to say I'm opt out. Like, I don't want to be, I don't want organizers to know anything about me. And so that's a big part of our security that you can get on there and say, Hey, listen, you can do it in your profile. You can do it on the onboarding. I don't want my stuff shared. And so I think it's completely appropriate and, and okay for a user to go, I'm not interested in that. And, 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 and I think we have to make sure that we protect the privacy of people by giving them multiple opt-out options. Um, now, the reason we show up to events, the reason that events have any sort of value proposition to the world is really boiled down to two things, education and connection. And so the entire value proposition to the organizer and the attendee is education and connection. And so in theory, you want a greater experience on education and connecting. You want to be educated more on the things you're interested in, and you want to connect to more people that are right for you. And so the motivation for the user is to say, hey, you're here. The, the whole reason you showed up here were these two variables. And we want to make them more uh, valuable to you. So, so there's, there's always that making sure we all remember why we're here. But it's also really important why the discovered tags are so important. Because maybe you go either it's too laborious or I'm too guarded to declare. Um, but if the discovery engine is running too, then you actually don't have to make any declarations we'll still be able to find, just by, the, by you going around and looking at things, we're gonna be able to help build that profile. So you're not, it's not an all or nothing game, I guess is my point. And a lot of these systems might say, hey, declare, but they're not tracking all your discoveries. And so you're really limited to that. And do you find that that tracking, is it based more on, on the, the, the information people give you or does the tracking play a bigger part in, in kind of making the system successful? I think the tracking is really important because remember, it's we're tracking what you're doing, not just what you said. And so we always yeah. kind of say this a lot in life. You know, you, you, it's, you really don't know what people's about by what they say. It's about what they do. 
I don't care what it is in life. Maybe it's health and nutrition. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's their, their, their financial, you know, I I'm really, you know, financials are really important to me. And then you, they're, you know, in tons of money and debt. And so, you know, you can say something, but what do you do is the actual essence of who you are. And so it's really important for us to go. We're really appreciative that you said these things, but we want to find out if it's true by your actions, because that's how we're really going to give you what you want. So those actions are really, really important. I think that's that's really interesting. I think you, you could really be, be on to something there. So I wanted to talk a little bit about engagement. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it comes up as the top challenge over and over in our uh, surveys and the research that we do, uh, particularly for virtual events. I think a lot of people have the Zoom fatigue. Um, I think, in my opinion, a lot of events are not particularly you know, designed with engagement in mind. What's your view on this? And, and, you know, do you have a recipe that can kind of help people overcome this to to design events that are really engaging? Sure. I think I actually like this question because I think there's a couple of things to think about. Um, One, this is an evolving story. So I think we are an impatient, demanding society that says, if you haven't solved the riddle, immediately you're failing. And I think we have to remember like um, in any sort of uh, innovation in the world, it didn't happen overnight. And so we've got to be part of an evolving solution, not just demand something we don't even know what it is. So my first thing I always pump the brakes on is, hey, listen, no one's going to solve this thing perfectly right away. The second thing, I'm going to get to an answer, by the way. I'm just I think it's always good to contextualize like reality too. I, another, I really like this. It's the, the context is really interesting. So I appreciate it. Yeah, cool. So that's number one. Number two, I argue as somebody outside of the industry, I've been to plenty of events where I see large sums of people walking alone, sitting alone, not being connected to other people. And I think of, I've said this again, events are often like um, early school age environments where you go in and there's cliques and there's people that we, that's a term here in the States, like little groups that know each other and um, you know, they don't talk to other people. It's, I haven't seen you in a year. So the 12 people get together. And my point is it's not like physical events had this riddle solved either. Plenty of people left feeling alone. Plenty of people left with bad business cards that weren't helpful for them. So I think we have a, we have a tendency to, you know, um, I have a little bit of a fantasy about how perfect something was, uh, when, when maybe that wasn't true either. And so I think what we get a chance to do is, is, bring a little bit of just facts to the equation and go, wait a minute, nothing's perfect. Everything's evolving. So let's talk about what is good. So now let me get to my answer. Um, One of the things I think that's so important, and we just demoed, I'll send you the link. We just demoed our, our companion app, which is launching this month. And we're actually, we just agreed to terms with a very uh, large public organization that's A lot of people are going to see and experience this very soon. But what's really cool about our app is we can target you, whether you're physical or digital, and we can begin to bring you together, again, based on all those things we talked about. So if I've got, if I download the Juno app and I'm in um, Dallas at the event, but somebody's in Denmark uh, like you, and it says, hey, wait a minute, I'm walking around on my app, but I get extra points if I connect with three people offsite. And maybe I wouldn't really care about that, except for I'm in a group. I'm in, it's a group competition. And everybody from, with my tag of mountain bike, I'm in a mountain biking group, let's just say that. And we're competing against other people, or I'm on team red and we're competing against team blue. And one of the things I've got to do is connect with three people offsite. But these three people aren't just random people because Juno has a trending engine of people you should know. So it's not just this big list of people you should know. It's actually in real time, the most congruent person to you is on top. And so what we got to do is we got to begin to say, just think about this concept for a second. If I went to an event two years ago and I went to plenty of them, I may have walked away and I'd be curious if there's any research you know about this, but I'm just going to generalize with, with my experience. I'll walk away with 15 to 20 business cards you know, just for meeting people. And four or five of those, let's say half of them 
we actually email back and forth and two or three of them, you know, get a little traction and maybe one of them, we do business together. I don't know, whatever the numbers are. And then I'll see you next year. Well, that's not a lot of business traction. Let's double it. Let's say I got 40 and 20 and three. Let's say I got 80 business cards. And then, let, but the point is, it's not this incredible number. It's just not. And I got to wait a year to do it again. And so when I started thinking about engagement, where I think we have to shift our minds is we bet so much of the farm on a three-day experience rather than allowing our, no other business does business like this. Walmart's not going out there. Amazon's not going out there. McDonald's isn't going out there going, oh my gosh, we have three days to succeed at our business. They're going, how do I provide value, transformational value, incentive-based value every single day to my customer? That's the bar for every other place that does business. And so I think we've got to get into a mindset that says, how are we providing absolutely tangible, irresistible value to our customers every day using scalable methods? And so to me, it's not, a. I look at this whole thing of like, how do you make engagement work in three days? Like, I see you don't, you don't, you make it work over 365 days. Okay. You, you break the mold and you expand your mind into, you know, irresistible value 365 days a week, year. So, you know, we've gone from kind of events to the, to the year round community, which I think is, is kind of what you're talking about. And I, I always find this argument interesting. I'm a big fan of communities. I was community manager for, for a while at IMEX, and I enjoyed that tremendously. Uh -huh. But I find that there's a bit of a, um, a challenge here because one, I think event professionals are focused on events. They're focused on one-time activities that are time dependent. Mm -hmm. And when you have to shift that to year round thinking, that's hard. And that's a yep. different set of skills and they may not be the right people, or they might need to learn new skills to be able to do that. But I also feel like there is a human element to this where we get excited about something that only happens once. You know, there's a sort of peak of energy around a particular topic. That's what makes conferences interesting. Absolutely. If we remove those peaks, if everything becomes sort of on demand or, or an ongoing yep. small hit of adrenaline or whatever you want to call it around these topics... I'm not sure, and I don't have quite a scientific evidence to back this up, but it feels to me that it's less, we get less excited about it. And then it becomes a sort of, I don't know, association thing or a sort of ongoing sure. thing. I mean, how do you, how do you keep the excitement if something is year round? And I don't disagree with the strategy necessarily, but it does feel like a lot of things need to be adapted there. Well, I think there's two different things that, that you brought up. Um, so let me try to unpack them. First of all, events are not going away. They're amazing. They're awesome. They're everything you just said. And they shouldn't go away. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, I remember the first time, Miguel, I went to an event in Europe. And it was um, in Lyon, France. And I, I flew there with one of our customers is HP. And, and we, were, we run all of their uh, employee engagement. We built a whole employee, employee uh, engagement tool. Flew out to Lyon, went in, and I remember... Uh, the smells of the bread and, and, and the energy and the wine. And I remember as an American who had never been to a conference in Europe, feeling just the, the, the community and the energy of Europeans all coming together and, and celebrating over their food and their wine. And it was a, um, you, you can't, it was awesome. It was amazing. And so to me, I go, why would you ever want to not have that? I just don't believe in an or mindset. I believe in an and mindset. And I think we look at it and go, is it going to be physical or virtual? And I go, there's no such thing as or. It's and. It is going to be this event and we have to raise the bar on our value proposition year round. Because I think for too long, we have allowed ourselves to have a low bar year round and a high bar and a peak. And I, I think we've got to, demand more. And I think our customers are going to demand more. 
as they start to engage more, look, the, st the, the stats are out there. Membership is in a decline. It's a fact. It just, pre-pandemic, membership was in a decline across events and associations. And, and it's all the research is out there. Why is that? Well, because there's so much content online, because there's so much networking online, there's so many things online. I think we have to raise the bar outside of the event to honor the value proposition demand that will exist in future generation users. There was a day when, when, when I think our, this is true in anything in life, Miguel. I mean, every, my, my, uh, one of our investors, he's this billionaire investor guy. He, he, he says this to me. I think it's such a good thought. He says, Josh, um, a startup or raising capital is like robbing a bank. Every bank has its own unique footprint and you have to get out before you get caught because every business gets caught. Every business gets caught. You know, Blockbuster, I'm not sure how relevant that is in your <laughs> Blockbuster got caught. You know, and I think events are going to get caught if they don't change and increase their value proposition or associations. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm outside of the industry. So I'm a challenger of like thought, but that's kind of like, <laughs> no, I, I think it's all valid. And I think it, it's, it's interesting. Um, yeah, I think it's, everybody's trying to figure it out. And, and I, I do appreciate your and mindset. Um, at the same time, I do feel that the event planners at the moment are really being asked to do more with less, right? And and we already had this before the pandemic, but the pandemic has just sort of uh, exacerbated that in the sense that, you know, many planners are just happy to have a job now and, and will just keep working until kind of exhaustion. And, and at the same time, travel budgets and, you know, budgets around events are not necessarily there anymore. So it's a tough time to sort of ask this part of the industry to do more right to create more and to have a sort of and focus i so. think it's hard man i mean um it's it's a hard truth and you don't have to do it yeah you don't have to um you are not guaranteed a future uh there's a lot of things in life that you go i don't i don't want to do that and i'm here's the truth like no event or an association has to improve and increase their value property. You don't have to do that. Yeah. You know, it's not a law. It but sounds like a pretty silly thing not to do though, if you're kind of but considering it, right? If you yeah. don't, you know, we do have to suffer the consequences and opportunities of our decisions. That's life. Yeah. And Absolutely. so I look at it and go, we just hosted an event for a, a really great group and they expected um, 3000 physical and 4,000 online. And it ended up being like 1,600 physical and whatever it was, 6,000 online. But here was the interesting thing. They had one of their events in the morning and it was a physician-based group. Um, I think the auditorium set like 1,500 or something like that. And they had 160 people come down for it and everybody else streamed it in their room. <laughs> and I mean, it's look, I'm not, I'm not making the rules. You know, people's behaviors have changed and we don't have to like it and we don't have to agree with it. You know, I always say that, but, but you don't get to change it. And yep. that's the hard part. You can't put Jack back in the box. And so you go, we, we can, we can fuss and moan and yell and scream and hate it. And that's all okay, but yep. it's not going to change it. Yeah. It's a topic that's coming up quite a bit. And I'm calling that the hybrid attendee. Mm -hmm. we used to say yeah. there's not such thing as a hybrid attendee there's a hybrid event but then you're either on site or online but actually if you give people the choice a lot of times that's what happens right they're in the hotel lobby they're outside the sessions they're not necessarily in the session room i mean listen let's talk about i know in our notes we talked a little bit about or we'll get to it later maybe but eq let's just let's just talk about the human behavior for a minute i'm a i'm a dad of two boys I run a very fast paced technology company and oversee two other companies that, that I run. I just flew to Denmark for an event and I actually have a few days alone. And I wanna network, but I'm sitting there in my room and for the first time it's quiet and nobody's bugging me. 
and nobody's looking over my shoulder and nobody's walking in and out of the room. And I go, you know what? Kind of feels good to sit here in my socks and my shorts and look out the window at this beautiful downtown and just have a minute. So you know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm just going to stream this session I'm really excited about and sit here in my socks for a minute. That's a real human moment. Because I, I can go sure. network for the next three days. I'm going to have this moment. And it's real. No, for sure. And I think that's that's what we have to um, face, right? That's just the, the behavior of people. I think the danger then is if if people you know, kind of get, get scared or, or shy away then from the networking. Because if they do that and then they actually don't go back in, they're just in their rooms and they get caught up in their day-to-day office job, but, you know, their emails come in and, and the time zones catch up with them, then you can end up people really missing out, right? And then it's sort so of like, why do you travel all the way to Denmark, right? Let me challenge that. Um, two nights ago, I was golfing and I, I walked into this little deli afterwards and I saw something happen that, that never happens anymore. Miguel, you just never happens anymore. What I'm about to tell you happened. This high school boy hollered over the cap of the counter or reached or talked over the counter at this young girl and said, are you single? She said, yeah. And he said, can I have your phone number? And she said, yeah. And I, I went, that doesn't even happen anymore. Why does that not happen anymore, Miguel? Because there's an app called Tinder and, or any other app and people just use that instead. So when you say to me, people aren't going to network anymore, I will say to you, you're talking about a, a old way that people used to connect. Because if you said to me, oh my gosh, if nobody ever leaves their house, they're never going to ask anybody on a date again. Everybody would look at you sideways. They go, oh my God, nobody asks people on dates anymore. You 90% of relationships form online. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the world's moving on. They, are, they understand networking. Now, here's where it gets cool. Again, you don't have to like it. It just is what it is. But here's where it gets cool. Let's say I'm in my room and I go, hey, Miguel's here. I don't know where he is, um, but I'm here. And all of a sudden it pings up and says, you and Miguel should connect. I don't have to be down in the lobby to meet you. I can be in my room in my shorts, ping you, chat you and say, hey, you want to meet up for a coffee this afternoon? So we're, we're enabling technology to enable connection, just like we see in dating any other relationships. So I don't think we want to say, if I'm in my room, I can't network. In fact, if I'm in my room, I might be able to network exponentially more and get the right moments I want versus randomly just going around hoping I bump into the right person. So there would be my challenge kind of back to that. Yeah. And I, I, I love this, this challenge. And I, 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 I tend to agree. I think there's, there's kind of two elements that I would say to that. One is there's an element of attending a physical in-person event that is also kind of going out of your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. And what I'm seeing is that if you give people the option to kind of be online and in some ways to yep. sort of hide behind sure. the online, a lot of times you're not pushed out of your comfort zone. Yep. And, you know, I, I like networking uh, when it's free and when I know a few people and I can kind of have sure. a conversation and I can get introduced to someone else. But if I'm kind of thrown into a, a room full of strangers that I know nothing about, it is a very uncomfortable yep. situation. And it's easy for me to shy away from that if I don't have this, like, I don't have to be there. I'm like, well, I can just sort of do something else. So I'm not questioning the value of that. I, I am feeling that there is a, a going out of your comfort zone, a sort of challenge or just challenging yourself when you're at physical events that, that yeah. I think makes sense. And I think that that serendipity and that sort of energy around events also comes a little bit from that, at least. And again, I'm an and guy. So I one you know one hundred percent agree with you. Um, I also know that um, <laughs> I would say to you uh, when I saw that young man ask that girl for her phone number, I was so proud of him. I even when he walked by me, I was like, "Way to go, man!" Because that took such courage to do that. I also know though those those moments that you just described. Um, there are solutions to help you be more productive. And if I said to you, Miguel, there's going to be a trending engine that's going to tell you seven people you need to meet, and you can actually look at the tags of why you should meet them. And all of a sudden you ping, hey, Josh, my name is Miguel. I'm here. I see we both are really interested in technology. 
Um, this is what I do. I can see what you do. Would you want to just grab a quick coffee? And you can still make them, you know, digitally serendipitous, but also give you that, like you just said it, like, I would like to be introduced. I'd like to have some sort of icebreaker, like get me, get me there. And I think we can use technology to make those physical events even more. You walk away and go, I met so many more people that I wanted to meet because I was able to have a little bit of competitive advantage with the technology opening some doors for me. Again, let me be clear. There is nothing. I wouldn't, I'm a huge social animal. And I don't mean that in like, I'm a little bit, I have a big personality, but I can be a little introverted too. I believe and I love the idea of human behavior. And so I don't, I don't believe that technology is ever more important or more um, meaningful than human connection. I'm a big human connection guy. So I don't want to send the message that I think, let's just get rid of events and just use, no, not at all. <laughs> I just also understand what's going on in society. And I'm not foolish enough to go, oh, we're just gonna, if we hate something enough, it's gonna go away. Not if, not if not everybody else hates it. You know, not if it's not helping everybody else. And then you talked about it a minute ago. And we talked about this the other day. Unfortunately, not everyone in the world is hyper-funded. You know, unfortunately, for some folks, money actually is a challenge. And when gas prices go up, it affects them. When travel prices go up, it affects them. And then when it goes across the universal board of flights are expensive, car rentals are expensive, hotels are expensive, gas is expensive, and I don't have all this extra income that I used to have, it's tough. And that is very true for a lot of people in the world. They just don't have tons of extra discretionary income or no longer does their company to go send them. There. So what are we going to do? Yeah. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. In terms of like the flip side of that, in terms of the, um, the business model around that, and I'm talking more for, I guess, the, what used to be the event industry, right? I mean, how are you finding the making the business model of the virtual side of events work? Are you finding things that, that are interesting in that area? Or is it, I mean, in our research, we're kind of seeing that sponsorship, most virtual events rely on sponsorship as the big yeah. kind of way to, to make money. And, you know, we're talking about maybe associations that kind of need to make money from their events because that's one of their main income sources. Do you have any any sort of any other ways or kind of, better ways of doing that, that are, that are good to get that sponsor ROI or any other kind of monetization that you could refer to? You know, I always say this, uh, as an association or an event, you have what the sponsors want. So never forget that. You have the football, as we say. And so you've got everything that they want. Don't, so start there, never forget that. Now, the way that you facilitated that value proposition up until the pandemic was like you said, the three day high. So we understand we have to understand we didn't lose what they want. Never forget that. We still have what they want. We have to continue to find creative ways to get what they want to them. So that's, you know, we got to break it down. Okay, how am I going to do that? Well, let's take a Juno, for example, because we're, we're talking about it. We got all the declared and discovered. We know who people are. We know what their interest is. So let's um, let's just we stick with the football analogy. Let's say we're the we're the um, some NFL association, and we've got all the coaches and players and buyers and everything all come into our event, and we go, okay, I know everybody who needs to buy medical tape. Tapes used a lot in the NFL. It doesn't, you know, it's not what you think about, but it's like every hand, every ankle. Okay, I know every single person, I know every single person in my association that needs to buy tape. And so what we're going to do is we're going to host an event online on all the future of tape, on where it's going, how it's working. And we're going to bring in some of our biggest sponsors to talk about innovation on tape, innovation on, on, on how to use it. And we're going to go out to every single person in our association that buys tape. And we're going to say, hey, three times a year, we're going to show you the evolution and, and the process and the creative insights to tape uh, three times a year. 
And we're not going to eat, we're not going to market this to every single person in our association. Because a lot of people that showed up to our NFL conference, they buy helmets. They don't buy tape. But don't worry, because three times a year, we're going to do these really cool, innovative sessions on how helmets are evolving. And so what we have to remember is if we have data and we have thought leadership, then we can, we can build the marketing campaigns and those big moments up that three times a year, we're going to blow your mind on, on the innovation and the progress on the thing you're most interested in. And here's what I found in life. If I'm interested in something and you're going to help me learn more about it three or four times a year, I'm interested because I'm interested, right? And so we have to stop blanket uh, making everything, everything about everything or about everyone. That's the first thing. We got to get smarter in the way that we, we deliver information to our people so that they show up. If I get an email saying, we're going to do an event on all things NFL, I'm not interested. If we're going to do an event on the future of tape, well, I'm a buyer of tape. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, we got to be better. Yep. So it's really about the segmentation, yes. learning data well, and managing those things. Yeah, and it's, it's a, what they want. Yeah, it's, it's a, it is a set of skills that is, I think, necessary, but not something that necessarily event professionals have already or are uh, proficient in yet. So yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So I wanted to also get your views on, on hybrid. We, we've talked a little bit about it. You talked about kind of doing hybrid before. What, what does that mean to you? And, and what have you seen kind of working well uh, in, in the hybrid space? Look, if we can be disciplined in this conversation, and I don't mean just us, but I mean the, the big conversation, um, what is the value proposition of an event or association? Like in any business, you constantly go back to your value proposition. So, so ours is delivering scalable, progressive, next generation technology. If we don't keep evolving, I just saw one of our competitors platform this week because they're looking at us to partner. I was shocked at how bad it was because they're huge. They do way more business than we do. And they're like, they, you know what they said to me? We're not going to evolve our tech anymore. It's, it, we're just, we're not a tech shop. And so we're looking for partners. As soon as you stop uh, progressing in your value proposition, you die. And so, and I'm going to answer this hybrid question, but it always has to get, we have to get back to a business question. What is our value proposition to our customers? If you hang with us, we will educate and connect you. We'll educate and connect you. Hybrid is all about increasing the opportunities to learn and connect. And so we think about, often, well, is hybrid a, like a second screen during three days? Is hybrid a different event a week later? Is hybrid 365? Hybrid is the same thing as your event, is the same thing as anything else. It's connection and education all the time. And the more you can do those two things, the more people are going to spend money with you champion you, stay with you. So I answer that to say, how are you creating more ways? This is what's cool about hybrid is, man, you know, what was so cool. I went to this conference and I didn't feel like going down. I didn't feel like leaving my hotel room. Like anybody that's doing a conference in San Diego right now, you know what they sold? They sold sunshine, beaches. And guess what it's doing right now? Raining. And maybe I don't feel like leaving my room, walking through the rain and going across the street right now, not to worry. My app is serving me up people and experiences that I can do right now and increase that. A week later, you know what was so cool about this, this event? A week later, it pinged me three people and two pieces of content that it knew that I would love. And you know what's so great? So often on these events, when I leave, the networking dies. Why is that? It makes no logical sense. Like it, it defies logic to tell somebody, our, our value proposition to you is we're going to help you network for three days. And the rest of the year, you're on your own. 
It doesn't make any sense. And so what I think hybrid is, is continuing year round to reinforce the value proposition that you sold me on as being a part of this organization. And you have tools to do it. So micro learning, networking, I mentioned earlier, I think hybrid is, hey, Josh, we know you're interested in tape. So we've got this really cool little micro course on how to, how to conserve tape and how to use it best and how to train people to put it on. We got this really cool uh, person that you should know that they actually do this too for a sister company like yours. You guys should connect and just talk about what you're doing. Like that's what hybrid means to me. It means providing more value on the proposition that you sold people on. Fair enough. I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I wanted to also get your view on on just general the, the future of the industry. And um, this may be hybrid, it may be, you know, year round 365 engagement. But how do you think in a in a sort of post pandemic world, events are going to be different? Yeah. Um, right, this is like, um, if you knew the answer, right, then, then, then. <laughs> sure. But, you know, I think it's always interesting to get different views and, and yeah. kind of understand what are the motivations for it to be different, right? Because I think nobody would have expected the things that, that we've seen or a lot of the things that we've seen, yeah. but you have to make a bet, right? You have to bet on the future of, of Juno, of any tool or any event. And then what, what's kind of your bet in terms of what's going to happen after we are able to have physical events? All right. So let me... Let me think um, bigger than events to answer this question, because you can't dismiss um, the financial and economic reality that we're going to live in, I think, for the next four to six years. Um, I'm no economist, but I'm not stupid. And I understand the realities of inflation. I understand the realities of what will probably be 24 months of a pandemic. Um, and so these are real things and we can put our head in the sand and act like they're not real. They're real. Inflation's a real thing. Uh, 24 months of, of, of damage to jobs and sectors are real things. And so I, I, I'm not trying to be a negative guy, but I'm trying to have an honest conversation about the world that we live in. So what does that mean then? Because that you can't just talk about the future events and discard reality. Like they're going to go hand in hand, right? They're going to affect each other. And so what I... That's why I set that up to say where I think the future is going to be, and, and let's call the future four to six years. I think it's going to be smaller and better. Smaller and better is what I think. Okay. And so what does that mean? I think it means uh, regionalized where, uh, you know, maybe I can, I can drive and go back home if I need to. Um, so, and, and I, so I think you're going to have better, networking it's not going to be what well, it's going to be tough it's not going to be like um oh a little happy hour at a bad hotel i don't mean that it's going to be better you know it's going to say we can't do one huge event because people can't fly all over so i think it's going to be smaller and better and i think you're going to see way more technology um provide the value that you've been dependent on the on the conference doing and I think it's going to be smaller and better because of, of economic challenges for people. Do you see it as being more of like a VIP experience? So rather than it being, you know, a nice conference for 300 people, it would be a, an experiential experience for only a hundred people. Is, is that kind of what you mean by smaller and better? Yeah. And you know, what's kind of hard is I hate this. And this is why I think technology is going to play a role. I I think it's going to be, oh, it's almost going to be, I hate to say this, I don't know a better way to say it, but a, a caste system where you're going to see more senior leaders and more affluent people have privilege to do things that maybe other folks don't. And I hate that. Uh, and that's why I am glad that technology can serve. But look, at the end of the day, if the ticket's 2,600 bucks and, and the whole thing to go by the time I get flights, hotels, everything else, I'm 5,000 bucks out. How, as a business, how many people can I afford to do that with, right? Yeah. And as an individual, do I have an extra 5K sitting around to go do this? So then in this case, hybrid is the option, right? To, to 
free this up and to give an opportunity for a different experience for those that, you know, that's out of their reach, right? But still honor the value proposition. Remember, that's what a value proposition, right? We propose it. It's a, mm -hmm. I, I'm propositioning you that I can give you this yep. and you're betting on it. You're going, okay, I'll buy your hamburger. I'll drink your beer. I'll fly your airline. You, I saw your commercial. Um, we're saying to people, I will educate and connect you and give you a great experience if you give me this money. And unfortunately, there's going to, and I, and I don't know if people, I don't know in your research or your conversations if people are really embracing the reality of economic challenge or not. I don't know. Um, I just, you see it out there. I think it's, you know, we definitely see it in our research, but our audience is very much in the event industry. So um, I think it's healthy to have this conversation as a wider conversation and, and think about all industries, right? And all businesses, because the event industry is such a meta industry anyway, it cannot exist by itself. It's, it can't thrive if everything else is not thriving. So I think it's, it's a very smart way of looking at it. Well, it is, it affects, it, every, you know, I, it affects everyone, you know, and, and I, it's not fun, but it, it, what it, what it allows you to do is be honest about the dynamic and start to solve it and go how, if it is going to be smaller and better, if, you know, I, I was talking to, listen, it affects our team, Miguel. I was talking to our, our CFO and our CEO this week. And I said, guys, we have to begin to think about how to make everything we do cheaper because budgets get decimated and, and we're not immune to that. We don't get a free pass, you know? And so we, whether it's software, I mean, everybody looks for discretionary spending as things start to tighten up, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, the U S has had two terrible jobs reports the last two months. Yeah. Our second one just came out for September is terrible. So anyway, I'm not trying to be, a, I'm not a doom and gloom guy. I, no, I'm no. not, I'm a perspective guy so that we can make great decisions. No, and I, I appreciate the conversation. I think this is really important. Um, and particularly because, you know, you, you've, you've had an incredible boom over the last few months, the last 18 months. And so I think it's very sobering and very realistic to talk of it in these terms. Like it's not that this boom will just continue. You know, there was specific, specific set of circumstances that made this boom happen. And I think it's very, uh, you know, it, it shows your awareness for the market and kind of understand, hey, this is, people are going to struggle. We can't just, you know, live up high and, and pretend like the event industry is just going to go on this crazy high or anything like that. I mean, listen, it's never going to go away. People love gathering together. Um, and it's, and it's a beautiful thing. And again, I'll say it, technology will never replace human connection. It yeah. never will, but it, but it might be able to heighten it. And it might be able to provide a source for folks that can't, for whatever reason, in this season of life. And, you know, Miguel, some people go through financial hardship. They go through relationship hardship. Some people are going, you know what? This event is scheduled at my kid's homecoming. Well, that's the thing in the States where it's like they're big once a year football or, or bat, you know, I'm going to be in my kid's homecoming. But I really still want to network and learn and connect. And so, again, and not or is, is yeah. really the mindset we have to have going into it. Yeah. Giving people the option and, and, and the possibility to do. And I think is, is, is really it's an excellent message. Josh, thank you so much. Let's wrap up there, but I wanted to ask the one question we ask all our guests to recommend the next guest on our podcast, well, the next yeah. guest, but one of our next guests uh, it would yeah. be great to get a recommendation from you. Yeah. I saw that note and I got to tell you, um, I don't know if you've ever, do you know, Don Neal from 360? I'm afraid not. So he does a, he has an, uh, an agency that helps kind of reimagine events. And I'm happy to make an introduction to you to him. He's one of the most asymmetric, um, challenging thinkers I've spent time with. Like every time I'm around him, I'm like, man, that really got me thinking. And so I would just encourage you to, if, you know, if people are listening, check out uh, 360 Live. The guy's brilliant. He's a wonderful man, high integrity. And I would really encourage you to have him on. Great. Fantastic recommendation. John, 
Josh, sorry. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. It's been a pleasure to chat with you over this almost one hour. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And uh, see you soon. Not see you, but hear you soon. Or hope to have you soon with us again on the Event Manager Podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Event Manager Podcast. Please subscribe and rate the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. For the latest news and the best articles on technology and innovation in the event industry, head over to eventmb.com. 